Society, close quote. Dr. Johnson's second book, co-edited with Alex Lubin, is Futures of Black Radical Radicalism, a collection of writings about the Black radical tradition, both in tribute to and animated by the work of Cedric Robinson. It is a great book, and I appear to have lent my copy to somebody because I can't find it anywhere, but it is also much annotated. Uh, Johnson has recently completed a third book with sports scholars David J. Leonard and Adolfo Mondragon, a co-edited volume titled Rings of Descent, Boxing and the Performance of Rebellion. Her current research for the monograph, These Walls Will Fall, examines the practices of sanctuary, home, and culture, uh, cultural placemaking at multiple scales. In it, she illuminates regimes of state power, as well as the forms of local and transnational activism that create spaces of regeneration. It goes without saying that this work could hardly be more relevant today. And we will hear about this project in today's talk titled Worlds of Interconnection, Freedom Making in the New Security Establishment. It is an understatement to say that Dr. Johnson is a scholar deeply engaged with the communities about whom she writes and whose writing and pedagogy is practiced collectively, relationally, and with mutual mutuality. In that spirit, we're going to do something a little different today. Throughout her presentation, we will keep the question and answer box open. Dr. Johnson will issue incitements, her word, to think along with her throughout the talk. And we invite and encourage you to post comments and questions during the talk. She will be able to read and respond and shape her remarks in relation to your comments. So this is a dialogic presentation in that way. So more than giving you the opportunity simply to chime in, we really want you to participate and help shape this event as it unfolds. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much, Professor Franco. Um, from the first time that we had a conversation about this possibility um, to like the pinnacle of you being like the best introducer in the world. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really humbled. I'm grateful that our paths have crossed and also want to thank Amy and um, Kimberly Scholl and other Dr. Derek Hicks as well for all of his um, motivation and encouragement and help in organizing this. I'm really, really happy to be here with all of you. And I do also wanna say uh, anecdotally how important Dr. Franco, your work is as well, how inspiring it is. And we're all better um, for uh, your work on the idea of the neighbor um, and also in, uh, in geographies of racial difference um, and identification um, in Los Angeles for those of us who study cities. Um, and so I'm just really excited to be here with everybody tonight. Thank you. Um, so I am, I am a researcher. I'm a storyteller. I am a freedom dreamer, as my colleague and friend Robin Kelly writes. Um, and as Dean said, I'm a cultural and social historian. And I'm presently writing a book about the meanings of freedom as articulated by unique collectives of organizers um, and how they redefine it through their activism. Um, and the ways that they demonstrate through, you know, examinations of community practices um, and also uh, uh, the research that so many of us who are community engaged scholars do on anti-racist um, practices, but also teaching um, and thinking about how we learn from organizers to redefine education and the nature of knowledge itself. That's what I'm about. So I'm also going to put something in the chat. Um, now, because I really want to encourage you all to follow along. So I have created something called a community board. And this is something that I've learned in my work with organizers and in healing circles with restorative and transformative justice practitioners. So feel free to click on that Google Doc. I made it accessible to everyone, I think. And this should be um, a way for us to stay engaged. And I would love for us to try to stay engaged, to try to acknowledge um, the ways that we've all come here, no matter how many and, or no matter how few, no matter what made you come, what who you heard about it from, why you're here, there's a message here for everyone, including me. And so I include this community board as um, an acknowledgement and a reference to the energy that we all bring into this room. I also honor the Gabrielino and Tongva people um, as the traditional land caretakers of 
Tovangar, which is the Los Angeles based in the South, Southern Channel Islands, and the Chumash people, because I'm coming to you from Ventura County as the traditional land caretakers of these traditional ancestral and unceded territory of homelands. And in that I pay respect to my ancestors, to my elders, and all our relation, relations past, present, and emerging. So I wanted to first start with that. So now that you have this link in the chat, this link to the Google Doc, I invite you to open it to follow along. Uh, we're sharing knowledge. So I've been an educator, you know, for about 20 years. And, you know, I was trained like so many of us were to become an expert, to become someone who downloads all my expertise in every lecture um, on all of these willing um, participants. And I noticed that as time went on, especially in the last like three or four years, it's gotten really old to me. It's been very hard for me to do that. Um, part of the reason is because I've realized that everything I know is because of my interactions with and situated knowledge that I have both been witness to and involved in. Um, and so I can't be the only one that knows this, that holds the space. Everybody's got to be part of it. Because if we're talking about learning, then it can't just be one directional. Everything is relational in that space. So it's in that spirit that I share this, this document. And I encourage you to write in it as well. So I, I've, I've encouraged the I mean, I have included there the land acknowledgement, but I also included the land back manifesto, which I think is very important. And I'm gonna sort of switch back and forth between different mediums here. So I'm gonna share with you um, a, a slideshow as well. And I want us to use this also to kind of like keep track of where we're at and um, also to give you a sense um, Play from our start, we'll start there, give you a sense of where we're going. So here's the first, this is my fancy title page. And this is the, um, the follow up to the land acknowledgement for those people who don't know about the land back movement and the campaign, which is something that is led by indigenous people, First Nations people, something you should know about, all of us should know about. And this is an entire movement that's been going on for generations. Now it's becoming more well known, but it's not just about an acknowledgement. And this is a, um, something that I think is a theme that should run throughout my entire presentation here today and as well as our, our um, dialogue. And that is that the land back movement in dialogue and intersecting with so many other movement, ideologies and demands, asks that we dismantle, defund, return, and they ask our awareness of consent. You can find this, there's a link in the, the Google Doc, the community board that I shared with you. You can find the manifesto there. And I encourage you to learn as much as you can about land back. A lot of people say, well, how could that be? Like, what would you say? Is the same thing question with abolition? and defund the police. People say, well, that's not possible. And this is something that I learned, um, something that I learned that I think is really important from one of my mentors, George Lipsitz, who was also a colleague for many years at UC Santa Barbara, is that never let your inaction masquerade as cynicism. Meaning like, don't, like if you think that it can't be done, you, you think abolition can't, be, can't happen because we have so many different layers of bureaucracy and infrastructure because we're all human beings that unfortunately, and I hear this all the time from students, like, well, but you know, it's inevitable that we're gonna fight wars. Is it? I mean, is it really? Or is that the inevitability of capitalism and racial imperialism? Um, don't let your cynicism or your, your inaction masquerade as cynicism. If you decide that it cannot be done, and this is the case with land back as well. If you decide that it's not the original caretakers who could take better care of this land than we can, who know how to set the preventative fires, who know how to take care of our mother, the earth, better than the, how, the, the terrible job that we're doing now. That cynicism may be masquerading for your inaction. So it's okay, you know, we are all entitled to our opinions, but move aside for those of us who believe in abolition, who believe in land back, move aside for those of us who are brave enough and courageous enough to dream a different kind of reality. And, and you know, there's no shame, blame or judgment there. It's just making way 
for people who have always had these answers to the problems that we now face in communities and in practices that they've always been practicing, right? So land back, if you don't know about it, now you know, and you should go and please do some research on this because it's really important. An outline for today's talk. So a short introduction of our time together. I'm gonna just, you know, tell you a few things about what I'm thinking, um, but I, I also have a question for you and then I'll go a little bit deeper into this like incitement as, as I um, discuss with Dean um, and then, I have this like really kind of burning question that I hope that we can all answer together or at least think about together, which is like, how will the interests people's parties that have profited from the Trump presidency's preoccupation with border security, black, black criminality, dehumanization of poor people, legislation of uh, legislating women's bodies, white free speech endure in this next four years? Why am I interested in that? I'm interested in that because I'm actually more interested in the narratives of freedom and the practices of freedom making that have always coalesced and been constituted not only in response, but first and always as a way of being, an epistemology, a way of, of seeing as well um, throughout all of, of the generations. And then I have another question for you after that. What does safety in our communities look like? And then I'll talk a little bit about freedom making and practices of restoration. And then I know that you all have been engaged in some really interesting discussions about doing this work in the, the university itself. Like, so how is it that we, in these in this moment of great awakening, but also of, of really terrible tyranny, um, how do we do this work? And so I hope that we can, I can be helpful, but we can also build together um, in that question. So that's our that's the introduction of our time together here. And so my question for you, and I, what I would like to, you to do, here's your task, is to please, and I'm gonna stop share for a moment because I wanna be able to see in the chat, right? It's the chat, right, Dean? <laughs> in the chat, please uh, answer this question. And that is, what makes you feel truly free? And I'll answer it first. I'll answer it first. It's my daughter's laugh. That makes me feel truly free. Um, being outside in nature. That makes me feel truly free. It says the chat is disabled, Amy. Sorry. Thank you so much for telling us that. The chat is disabled. And maybe we can also put it, if, if it can be enabled, then we will put it in on the community board. Amy, are you able to look in on that? Should we do the chat or should we do the Q&A? If people could um, put their, their answers to the questions in the Q&A, that would be great. Okay, okay. so not Thank the chat. You. Okay. Yeah, not the chat. Thank you. Got it. So in the Q&A then, please answer this question for all of us. What makes you feel truly free? And um, I cannot seem to post in the Q&A, but it's okay. Yeah, so I also wasn't able to post in the Q&A. Okay, so why don't we do this? We can go to the community board and we can go where it says, I put some resources there as well. Um, the colonization resources. After introduction, do you see everybody where it says introduction and plan for convening? I'm gonna put this question, or I did put it here in the group think, what does mm -hmm. freedom feel like? What, what does freedom feel like to you? I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna put my answer again here, which is my daughter's laugh being outside in nature. Um, good food mm. time with friends. Okay, how are we doing? Anyone can open, are people having trouble posting? It looks like- um, I'm not able to edit. Okay, let's see if we can make that happen. There are people who have begun posting answers in the Q&A. Oh, good. Okay. As well. Well, I'm going to take a look over there. Me too. Absolutely. Thank you. Being outdoors in nature, in the water, among the trees. Great. So it looks like you can answer in the Q&A. 
Beautiful music. Thank you, Melissa Jenkins. Crossing city bridges, how interesting. Warm mm -hmm. sun on a cold day, how nice. Making food, spending time with friends and family, music, spending time in the woods. Shade of yes, I would be there with you. When other people can be great, that's nice. And being in a desert, <laughs> like that. Making money, making music. And my father smiles, so sweet. Can you resend the link to the community board? Yes, I can. It's in the chat, but I'll put it again. Davida de Rocher, laughing with friends, sunshine, the sound of the ocean, creating art via with black folks, hearing my baby nephew laugh how sweet, listening to music and writing, surrounded by mountains, cooking for people I love. Oh, these are amazing. Being outdoors, breathing fresh air, cooking healthy food. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Getting to work on my mental health. Yes, Jessica Rowe, yes. Outdoors at night with a close friend, love that. Being at home, doing my own thing. That's me, introverts all are in the house. Making food and feeding family, friends. Nice, driving with the windows down. This was me last night at dusk. All right, Brother Hicks, feeding folks my gumbo. All right, I hope that's a promise. Dreaming my, of my dad and his Colombian wisdom, nice. Being with my family, dreaming of my dad, it's nice. Running, running, yes. The sounds of birds, looking up at the stars, thank you. Everybody, thank you so much for participating. That means so much. This is what we're talking about in terms of being in community and also refusing um, that kind of like old model of, 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 of lecture and, um, and, and, and not being aware and acknowledging this moment now of where we need to do this kinds of exchange. So thank you so much for those answers. And I'm hoping we can think together about this some more. So I'm just gonna say a few things. This is my incitement part of this, of this um, time together today. So this is not something I've figured out. I wanna make that clear to everybody. Um, I'm still thinking this through and I, I hope we can be helpful to each other. So this, this first is a question that I have and I think I share this question with many, many folks. Um, after four years of, of really of awfulness, right? Which was really just four years of pulling back part of a curtain um, uh, from what has and continues to, to still be there. Right? Because let's not forget that 74 million people voted for Donald Trump in 2020. Um, so after a period of stupefying centralization of wealth at profound cost and harm to those already struggling, through the anguish of police violence that brought us out in mass protests and knowing that the crisis most enduring manifestations in housing, in education, healthcare, employment are, are getting worse. We know these things. This is well known as the pandemic recession deepens. So how, this is a question, this is the incitement. How do we read this moment, right? As freedom seekers, as disruptors, what is this? What is this? What is this particular moment as we enter this new presidency? What is this time? How do we move in it as educators, as students, as organizers, allies, as accomplices? And I'm willing to go out on a limb here and say that many folks bar of expectations around democracy, even neoliberal democracy has been significantly lowered. No, I mean, this is the case. Right, that there is fatigue that a lot of us feel, and for many reasons, and also a hope that in the re restoration of like these keywords right now that are everywhere civility, decency, security, order that somehow we can at least be functional in a horribly dysfunctional nation. Now, I've often heard and said as well that one of the most pervasive aspects of abuse is that it encourages you to doubt your own intuition. And that's what we've been dealing with over the last four years. As, and especially most intentionally, this was meant for already disenfranchised, surveilled, criminalized communities of black, brown, queer, immigrant, houseless, food insecure folks. So to regain our mark, to recover our intuition, which is already there. A lot of people despair about that. What do you mean we never had it? Cause we always lived in this racially capitalized, um, capitalist society. No, communities have been practicing this for years. Just because you don't see it on Instagram or CNN does not mean that it is not here all the time, always being remade. So I feel this urgency to revisit the practices and principles of resilience, of restoration, of resistance, so that I can get clear with people in community. 
I heard Cornell West say the other day, when neoliberal policies come along and you get all the rationalizers of globalization that don't say a mumbling word about inequality, don't say a mumbling word about mass incarceration and so forth. And then some people say, well, I mean, I guess the, the, the right wing isn't saying much about this. The libertarians aren't saying much about this. This independent party isn't saying much. So let's just try the Democrats. And meanwhile, boom, he said 1% walk off with the most, most of the wealth. So I feel this urgency to understand and to move in this moment from a place of being centered. And what is that place? The greatest, I think the greatest writers, the greatest freedom thinkers have taught us that it's one that we make and enact while struggling amid multiple contradictions between neoliberalism and democratic governance. I wrote about this in Future of Black Radicalism between settler colonialism and the promise of marketplace participation. This place of being centered of finding our marks is at the intersection of abolition and land back, of repair and transformation, of individual and family. It's not a static place from which to be curious or analytical. It's not an easy place, we know this, and yet it's the most honest place, beloved community. Therefore, then freedom seekers and cultural workers as they have at every new political juncture have found it necessary to perform more than an exercise of intellectualism. It's more than an intellectual exercise. This has to be a critical practice. So that's what I want us to do today. And one of the things that's most of my mind over the past few months has been, how will the interests people parties? Back to our first question who have profited from the Trump presidency's preoccupation with border security, black criminality. I'm gonna come back to sharing my screen. Um, dehumanization of poor people, legislating of women's bodies, white free speech endure in these next four years. Now Stuart Hall talks about what hard work hegemonizing is. He said, hegemonizing is hard work. It's one of his more famous quotes. And basically he means, for those of us who are still students of cultural theory here, is what, basically what he means is that the way that people narrativize, the way they justify power, that work is actually very hard for people in power. I remember I was sitting waiting, uh, I mean, watching um, like a, a, a snippet of Castaway, of people who watched that film with Tom Hanks before. I was watching this film and like kind of like, really got wrapped up in it because it was like the first time in months I'd had time to watch a film. And then I guess start getting all these texts and I had like 32 texts. People are like, are you watching TV right now? Look at, turn on the TV and here's the Capitol riot on January 6th. And then, so I turned it on. What was most in in interesting to me was not like that this, the, the Capitol is being stormed. Like that didn't surprise me at all. I don't know if, who was surprised by that. What surprised me and what I found so interesting was how news anchors were scrambling to try to explain it. And then just after it, 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 it sort of like subsides, right? And nobody's been really hurt. Like there's a few people have been hurt, but at this point we don't know about some of the folks that have been killed and really and, and really hurt by this. But, but it's like them trying to figure out like what, how, wait, the difference between this and the Black Lives Matter process trying to make the explanation on national television in real time was hard work. But all of those people and everybody they had on for like the next six hours was stumbling over this. So how will this narrative endure and in what forms when its representatives have changed? And security is one of the many principal things that come to mind. And so CLR James talks about how during the Cold War, like with the McCarran Act and so many other uh, preoccupations with national security, the nation transforms from talking about protection to instead security. You could no longer rely on protection and service, but instead on security and enforcement. And that, that's what characterizes the Cold War. And I think we're kind of here again, we've been here many times. I mean, this happened, when we think of legislation that follows 9-11, um, right? And, and the attacks that, um, where, where lawmakers swiftly expand the country's prosecutorial and surveillance powers and what happens when immigration comes under the Department of Homeland Security under Obama and the irreparable damage that both of these kind of long patterns cause. And throughout the Cold War, in the wake of 9-11, 
and during any period of intense consolidation of wealth, which is what we're seeing right now. We know this because so many people are talking about Bezos, and how much money Amazon has made and how much money all of these, these sort of top um, conglomerate corporations have made, right? Um, we see this combination of an uh, emphasis on greater personal responsibility as the best way to guard against the unknown. So the threat is the virus, the threat is the immigrants, the threat is these black criminals. And the way to, to, to make sure that you protect yourself is through personal responsibility. This was you know, part of the old narrative that we, we say old was just a couple few months away, right? But, and also coming into the new, how is this narrative, how does it sustain even if the players change? The national threats, the threats to heter hetero patriarchy, all of this stuff is like on full blast, capitalism with its clothes off during the Trump presidency. But, and we see this in combination with the defunding of public programs. We see this over and over again, but we see it especially just in this, these past few years and months. And the, of course, defunding of, of, of programs that are meant to conserve and protect our climate and our earth. So Kiara, um, um, Kianga Yamada Taylor has written that she says the optics are cruel. The well off and elite take refuge away from the threat of the virus, buffered by the bodies of poor workers forced to labor under threat of disease. And she and many people are pointing out that since we have this aversion to taxing wealthy uh, individuals and corporations, this has left local governments very ill prepared to effectively respond to local crises of unemployment and poverty. And so what do people do? They turn to, to policing to manage the inevitable problems that arise in the absence of a robust economy and no safety net. This is what happens. So there are some things that could not be more important right now. Abolition, defund the police, divest, and invest in our communities because the proportion of local budgets that law enforcement takes up. And this is in many, in many ways in response to this, this sort of knee-jerk response to self-protection through personal responsibility and also this question of national security. It becomes really easy to say it was this hand group of white thugs, these far right people, you know, that it was just them, it was just like some bad actors, right? We, it's become very easy to say that. Um, to in, in order for us to get back to this narrative of civility that makes people feel so safe. So this is why when we think about how many tens of millions of dollars that are used to settle lawsuits in response to police killings, police brutality, all of the things that are still going on right now. This is why defund the police, why divesting in police, the structures that serve white supremacy culture and investing in communities cannot be more important the millions that are written off as the cost of doing business. Imagine what we can do with that money. You think about how we get these grants for $10,000, $100,000, even $500,000. What we do with that in our communities, it's incredible. We do so much with nothing. So let's take a moment to bring awareness to how security is linking the last presidency to this one, how it's driving the narrative of safety and also exclusion, who belongs and who doesn't, how is personal responsibility showing up in this question of national security? And then after I finish this part, I'll be done with my incitement and I have more questions for you. There have been these recent reports um, of how the LAPD sought protest related footage. Some of you have probably heard about this from Amazon's Ring Home camera systems um, in the wake of George Floyd's extrajudicial murder last year. And you, so you know you can share your video. I think those people who have a ring, you know you can share your video with others like in your neighborhood or you can share it with anybody. And it turns out that you can't decide which parts of the video you can share and which ones shouldn't be shared. Um, and people are, the police are able to secure that footage and use that um, against people. Not only that though, and this is, this is the amazing part about Sarah Brain's new book um, is that they're also policing the people that are with people. So alleged offenders. So this is why people have found, and as I said, um, there's this incredible book that and I wrote down the title. Here it is, uh, Sarah Brain, um, her new book with Oxford University Press, Predict and Surveil, Data, Discretion, and the Future of Policing. 
Um, and she talks about how there are in, at certain in certain ERs there are cameras that are set up just outside that allow police who have maybe brought someone from could be the scene of any kind of crime could be you know um, hit and run it could be burglary it could be any kind of uh, violent crime or any kind of crime these cameras are meant to be able to record the license plates of the people who bring in people who are injured. And so in effect, they are criminalizing and surveilling the people who are with these people. The, in, in combination with algorithms that are used by police that, that enable pervasive private surveillance networks, all of this together, it makes police practices even more questionable. And it's not just the police like on a local level, there's a range of companies that a lot of people are starting to bring attention to. The way that Amazon, we talked about Ring already and Microsoft as well have moved into um, the national space. So from 27 to 20, 2017 to 2020, the 1.6 billion or trillion dollar valued Amazon hired 20 former FBI agents, at least two of whom are responsible for monitoring the labor organizing activity of its workers to keep unions out. And Amazon was actually caught last year trying to hire two what they called intelligence analysts who are responsible for tracking labor organizing threats within and outside of the company. And then after this was exposed, they quietly filled these positions with two former FBI agents and hired four others. So if we think about how this is happening in the middle of the pandemic, right? It's like in all of 2020 and also leading up to this as well, because like I said, it's 2017 to 2020, but it really picks up in 2020. So as we think about this and we think about the, its connection to local policing, there, I was thinking of this guidebook that was published by LAPD in 2020 that makes it clear that this big data that's driven by Amazon and Microsoft is con continue to prominently figure in policing in LA. And there's all these different kinds of algorithms that people have studied from my colleague, Kelly Lido Hernandez to again, Sarah, Sarah Brain's book um, and how this has expanded its access to data by moving into coronavirus tracking now and vaccine safety analysis. Last year, Palantir um, is one of these data companies and a lot of them go to the police departments almost like pharmaceutical vendors go to doctor's offices. They come, they broker lucrative contracts with the National Institute of Health, the Food and Drug Administration, local police departments, and Palantir went public in September 2020. And the stock prices have tripled, more than tripled since then, since September. These are algorithms that they're selling to police. And Brain's book um, shows how these systems mean, of course, that individuals in over-policed neighborhoods can get easily caught up in these vicious cycles where they're more likely to be stopped, thus increasing their point value, justifying their increased surveillance, making it more likely that they'll be stopped again in the future. And so when we think about the history of policing, it's not actually public safety. It's not protection, right? It's enforcement, it's security in these ways that are not for people of color and definitely not, not for non-white folks, not for poor people. Most of the people that are in jail are poor. It's about the content, having the content to cause harm. And people will ask then, what about mass incarceration? And this will be the last part here. Is that another aspect of this question of security is it's like this I'm thinking through is that we know in California, there's a de-escalation of prison buildings but it's also an, accompanied by an escalation of electronic monitoring and algorithmic prediction. And that's also gaining popularity all over in Illinois, around the country. There's an article in The Intercept that says that these are known as risk assessment tools and these predictive in, in instruments crunch hundreds of thousands of data points on prior defendants to predict whether an accused person in front of the court can be rearrested or skip hearings. And they use arrest histories, convictions, missed court dates, so many different things. So you could be arrested for jaywalking or given a ticket, say, for jaywalking today, and then be pulled over because of a signal, your signal's out tomorrow. That's two points right, already. And about one in six counties in Illinois already use these tools. So it's so important for us to understand this because of this question around 
protection, security, safety, freedom. Since January 1st, and increasingly since January 6th, 11 state legislators have, legislatures have introduced 17 bills, including those that were filed before the Capitol insurrection. And all of these are legislation that weaponizes against already over-policed communities. And this is all legislation for national security, allowing people to be arrested for any kind of threat against any kind of police officer or some officer of you know, the nation somehow. So we can compare, maybe 11 state legislatures that have introduced 17 bills doesn't sound like a whole lot, right? But compare that to zero during the same period in 2020, nine in 2019, five in 2018, and 13 in 2017. And this, and the 2017 spike, why 13 in 2017? Because this was due to the, to the, um, uh, the Dakota, uh, Sandy Rock protests. And this is what we're worried about, friends. This is what I'm worried about, is that this, right, this, this legislation is going to be weaponized against us in many respects. James Kilgore, who is a writer and an educator, and he, he does a really amazing job on media justice, if you ever want to check out that website, it's really important, it's really good, good work. He writes about mass incarceration and he says, look, we already had all the tools the nation needed to aggressively disrupt and hold accountable those who planned and participated in the storming of the Capitol. But there's all this legislation that's been quietly being passed, including Thin Blue Line and Protect and Serve Acts um, that explicitly corporatize advocacy and threaten grassroots activists with up to a decade in prison for using intimidation or coercion to influence policy of a government. And we want to see how that also um, plays out when it comes to environmental protesters, because a lot of this is being legislated in places where this is taking place. For example, in Minnesota, um, indigenous-led pipeline opponents participating in a direct action protest movement against Enbridge's Line 3 tar sands pipeline in the state have repeatedly halted pipeline construction. There's a bill in Minnesota that focuses on those individuals who aid oil pipeline protesters, and it includes up to 10 years imprisonment if their associate damages the property with intent to prevent pipeline operations. So we know from Nick Estes, from Charles Sepulveda, um, Cornel West, so many other folks that now, you know, if we're talking about domestic terrorists, then all of a sudden, Yes, the people who storm the Capitol are domestic terrorists, yes, yes. But also what happens if you say you're critical of occupation in the West Bank? Uh, does that make you a, a domestic terrorist as well? We have to be really clear that we're not for massive repression and censorship and the defense of rights and liberties, even as we're um, against white supremacy, heteropatriarchy and other ideologies that leave aside the humanity of people. So we see this um, in the wake in, of some of the largest and most visible protests for racial justice. What we see is this popular discourse being reinvented. But I think, friends, let's move this to this next um, question because I think that we need public schools, we need housing, we need hospitals, we need libraries that are funded as well as the police, as well as cities and states fund those departments to pay for the prisons and jails. So my next question for you to put into the Q&A, that's what we did last time, right? Um, is this, what does safety in our communities look like? What do you think safety looks like? If we're not allowing other people to define for us what safety is, how would you define it in your community? Q&A, How do you find safety? Okay, so now we're back to panelists can't post in the Q&A, so you're answering here. Okay, thank you. I feel, thank you, Dean. I feel most safe when I know my neighbor cares for me and my neighbor knows I care for them, yes, thank you. So there's no way for folks to respond right now in the Q&A, right? 
Okay. Yeah. There, there should be, yeah. We. Oh, yeah, all the attendees can actually respond yeah, in the Q&A. For some reason, just uh, me, you, and Amy cannot uh, okay. be in the Q&A. I don't know why. Okay. Thank you, Chantel. Uh, Gertis, localized frameworks of accountability for responding to and preventing harm. Thank you. Other people, what does safety in our communities look like? Trusting and communicating with neighbors, yes. Thank you. Other people, John um, Bud, thank you. Jack Amaro, the absence of perpetual fear, hello, yes. The absence of perpetual fear. And then I wonder what's the presence, Mr. Jack, if I may, I'm sorry, I, I pronounced you there. Um, the absence of professional, I wonder what's the, what would the presence be? Ellen Snow, being able to walk outside by myself, yes. Benjamin Sabetti raised his hand. Perhaps you could post in the Q&A, Benjamin Sabetti. Jared, you're leaving my door unlocked, yes, thank you. This is what safety in our communities looks like. For me also, as a person who works alongside reproductive justice advocates, a place where teenagers can get birth control if they want it, right? If they want, if they want it, right? Boys, girls, anybody, anybody can get birth control, access to abortion, access to health care. Um, an adult who can help them. Healing circles. Um, we still have a raised hand. I'm not sure how we would um, address that, but. Jada Williams, mutual respect and protection of one another's physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental well-being. Amy, sorry, you were going to say something? No, I'm sorry. I was just going to write to Benjamin in the chat and ask to, to, okay, to put his question in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for answering that question again about presence would be peace, feeling safe, he, him. Thank you. Um, Adrian um, Pilon, uh, safety is a community where housing is stable, affordable, environmentally healthy. Hello. Yes access to outdoor space where neighbors know one another. Yes, yes, yes. In Ventura, we had um, a park we were trying to get built for about 20 years here. And in the meanwhile, they built this beautiful park on the east side, which is where mostly white and middle upper class folks live. And on the west side, which is 96% Latino, we just couldn't get a park. They built a pool, Olympic sized pool over there and everything in, on the east side. West side, couldn't get that park but just recently put enough pressure, we got that part. Outdoor space is so important. Um, uh, let's see, where are we at? Apple and abundant resources when wanted or needed, yes. Not having to watch my child walk all the way to his destination in his own neighborhood. Yes, I feel you, Derek, that is the same here with my child. Everybody has basic things they need, yes, yes. Food, shelter, health care, reproductive health care. As of right now, safety in communities feels untenable. I hear you, Anna Bittner because it's something to be bought or traded for. It is a consumer economy, isn't it, safety? But safety would be known, knowing if I'm cared for based on the sole characteristic of being a community member. Thank you, yes. Just that being enough, right? Just that being enough. And I wanna just emphasize what you said there because this is the, the, the principle, the foundational uh, organizing principle for so many folks who do restorative and transformative justice in communities that are marginalized and and disgraced by our uh, by our current um, uh, like group of leaders, right? And that is this is is that we're just by being human are enough to to have safety in communities. Um, checking in on neighbors. Thank you, Jessica Rowe. Being able to walk out of my front door without feeling fear. Safety feels both internal and external. Yes, it can't be conditioned or bought. And then my children. Jose Villalba, um, not be chastised for having a funny last name or for not being Christian. Yes, yes, that's very triggering for a lot of us. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add um, and join? I'm so grateful for your responses. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to switch us back to our, um, I'm going to switch us back to our, <clears throat> bear with me for one second. I'm going to share my screen again so that I can switch us back to the slides because I wanna go one more place before we end. I know we're heading into um, the red zone of time. So I wanna talk for a moment about 
community engaged scholarship as it is currently described, because there are lots of different names for it that people use in different places, depending on what you're doing. I have been teaching, um, I teach I teach these big classes at UCLA. Sometimes I have up to like 900 people in one class, which is probably hard to understand at Wake Forest. <laughs> but um, I have 16 TAs and you know we do this big thing. And the idea of course in an institution like that or in a class like that, I should say, is that you then have this very corporate model, this very corporate model of, of, of public education. And you know, a lot of people say it doesn't work, but the way that I look at it is that I got 900 people here that are like here to listen to me. So I better have something to say, but I also better understand who I am with in relation to the community that we are in. So that's why we do the land acknowledgement obviously is because we need to set a context and a space and then understanding for where you already are. We can't really talk about reparations before we talk about land back. We, those things can be in conversation, but we need to understand the context, right? So I get to talk with a lot of students. And if I get to talk with a lot of students, that means I have almost 900 willing workers to, to engage in a community that we're in. So I wanted to share with all of you who are teachers, the way I do this work in answer to something that you had asked Dean, which was like, so people are feeling like they wanna know, how do we do this work? And the question for me is, uh, is really comes down to a couple of things. My former colleague, and friend who we lost oh, several years ago now, unfortunately, in 2011, Clyde Woods. In fact, you can see behind me, there's a picture from Haiti. He gave that to me about six months before he died. He came, he came back from Haiti, he gave me this picture. Um, he used to say, you know, we're not, um, we, we cannot be academic coroners. Like we're not here to like be just giving everybody the trauma drama tour of what's going on in our communities. That's not our job. We're not here to perform some kind of like social triage. We think too much of ourselves. And he and Ruthie Gilmore, who are very, were very close, went to grad school together. They had this really interesting intellectual argument that was ongoing about social death. And social death is not something I won't go into too much here, but um, uh, originally like people, talk, uh, Orlando Patterson talked about it. A lot of people talk about social death as, as like, really kind of a complete and pervasive evisceration of life um, that people like, especially racial capitalism affects, particularly in the context of slavery and enslavement. Um, and uh, Professor Gilmore talks about social death as one of the byproducts of mass incar incarceration. But Clyde always used to say, don't talk to me about this social death. And when I talk, when I talk about New Orleans, ain't nobody dead here. All of us are alive. Like we're doing all of these arts practices. We're here fighting back with the blues, with hip hop, with all of these different languages that we use to state our very aliveness, right? And so I don't wanna be an academic coroner. I, I love what Ruthie has to say, by the way. I mean, she and I are all constantly in conversation about this, these things and she is um, just such an incredible, incredible model for how to do community engaged scholarship. But I point that out because the, the, the most, the thinkers who think in the most complex ways about these things, right? They argue, they don't know that all the time who's right, things change, right? So when, when we do community engaged scholarship, we should be prepared for there to be no resolution to these things. We should be prepared to be in process, to be in beloved community together. We should be prepared for the fight for sometimes the loss as part of even movement work, right? And then we should be also prepared to understand where we regain our energy. Too many people and a lot of organizers talk about this as like a cycle. It's like there's an issue that comes up. We realize we gotta do something about it. We organize, we fight, we win, we, or we lose. We're exhausted. Everything's been extracted. We're, we're exhilarated, whatever the case, we retreat, we regroup, we recalibrate. But a lot of times we don't restore and we don't spend enough time in that place of restoration. What happens in that place of restoration and rest is that you start to learn about your community. You produce art, you produce all kinds of things that bring you closer into community and help you to understand your context. And that is what you need for community engaged scholarship. 
So what I do is I ask community organizations what they need. That's where I start. I don't get, a lot of people will, will ask their students, hey, go find a project. And um, that's great until they descend on a nonprofit organization or grassroots organization and say, hey, give us a project and create more work for the organization. So we need to ask people, what do they need? Like, I don't start from what's on my syllabus that I need to teach them per se, but I'll go to Healing Hearts Restoring Hope, which is a victim offender um, transformative justice organization in Boyle Heights or Hunger Action LA or LA Can that works on Skid Row. Well, what do you guys need? And sometimes they say, we need a logo and a web page or at Healing Hearts Restoring Hope. There was all these women who were like in their late 60s who were like, we've been running this for so long. We don't know nothing about the Snapchat, like Instagram, Twitter, tweeting thing. We need a platform and what we can do that. Okay, well, we also need a couple of commercials. Can you guys make commercials for us? Okay, and so my students are making these like little YouTube commercials for the LA co-op lab, um, acting things out, how to make a co-op, those kinds of things, right? They, they don't, the, the, the people at Hunger Action LA said, we need you guys to come and lead our low vision seniors to the farmer's market on Saturdays. We could do that. We could do that and we could also help you if you need it, translate your 70 page people's guide to where they can get food into Spanish and update it. Um, Healing Hearts Restoring Hope said, our files are a mess. Can you come in and reorganize? And in, through all those kinds of contacts that people have, eventually my students ended up filming these little snippets um, of victim and offender encounters. And um, now Healing Hearts Restoring Hope can use them on their website. Learning about community from community members requires focus and discipline. It's not the fun, easy class, the one-off, whatever. It's that there are practical things to be done. There's fascinating research to conduct. There's not statements to proclaim or victims to say. We have to completely reorient our understanding of what community engagement is. We have to understand that freedom entails what seems like a lot of ordinary work. And in doing this work, we are empowered to take stock of the skills we have, many of them the result of privileges that have not, that have too often been denied to marginalized communities. We want to understand the conditions and the possibilities of this work. Also coming back to what I had originally been talking about around security and public safety and the answers that you gave, thank you, around freedom and safety. We wanna understand these things as a challenge to white spatial imaginaries. We wanna understand them as a challenge to carceral logics, a challenge to settler urbanism. So even if you say something as simple as, I wanna be able to breathe the fresh air, that is itself a radical practice. And we need to be able to understand that as freedom. And if we can't put a whole lot of really intellectualized language to it, maybe all the better. Maybe we're trying to strengthen relationships of reciprocity and accountability what we call research justice in order to remake the role of a public university in racial justice. Anyway, I will stop there because I want to be able to answer questions and engage with folks, but I'll leave you with this that I just read a couple of days ago by Julie Livingston, who's a uh, journalist, that healing the body requires healing the body politic, the collection of people who together form a larger whole. That will mean tending to the relationships that constitute the body politic in their greatest and most intimate iterations, which is very important for us. And that's why we have to be in community as much as possible and we have to trust the process as much as we can, not to give us resolution, but instead to deliver us into a greater understanding and awareness of ourselves and each other. Stop there, thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> I want to do something a little awkward now. Uh, first, I want to thank you so much for the information, the inspiration, the incitement, the revolutionary vision of pedagogy um, it was extraordinary. And uh, I had not, Amy and I were not at all prepared for this level of, of dynamism and invitation. Had we, had we been prepared, we might not have done a webinar. So now we're all stuck, stuck not being able to see each other. And yet I want to do this awkward thing of inviting folks who can stick around to pose questions directly to our guest uh, about things you've heard, things you are yourself thinking about um, in relation to what uh, she's been talking about. Maybe you're thinking about your own pedagogy and 
um, want to run questions by her, or maybe you want more elaboration on some of these community building projects of which she is a part. Uh, so I'm saying that uh, in the Q&A, that's the right place to do it. Uh, this would be the time for you to raise, to raise questions. And we can kind of pause and just let you gather uh, for a moment or two. I certainly have my own questions, which I can raise if nobody, if nobody else does. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and give folks a moment to, to see if they have questions uh, uh, to pose for our guest. And I also want to encourage appreciations that people might have for each other, because again, we're all here in community and just because we can't see each other doesn't mean that we're not all here. And so uh, we got so many replies. We had like 48 different replies to the questions that I asked. So I know that people saw something in the, in the Q&A that spoke to them. So feel free to um, also appreciate each other. Can I begin by asking you a question about, and I see one just popped up in the Q&A, so I'll make mine very brief. Um, a lot of academics sometimes feel like they're just chained to this, this academic project and, and, and their career and the restrictions of their university and so forth. And somehow you've been able to turn that around where you're using the institution and all that it affords you to do the work that you know needs to be done. And how did you know to make that move? Was that something that you grew up with? Is that something from your graduate training? When did you say, hey, I've got all these tools and I'm going to go use them rather than be used by them? Thank you so much for that question. So I'm gonna just, uh, again, like uh, trust in, in the process and, and, and the community here. And I, even though I can't see all you all, I just, from your answers, I just assume this is a place of, um, of, of, of no blame, no shame, but also uplifting each other here. So I will just quite, quite, quite honestly say to you that, um, you know, I, I have the privilege of having tenure. I did the grind that everybody's supposed to do. I was trained as a PhD student with some really amazing folks. And um, I wrote what I had to write and all of those things. So I did, I did the work, but on the way, I became more and more uncomfortable with a lot of the things that I was then be asking to mentor students into. And part of it is because like in any organization or corporation or institution, there are those kinds of relationships and, and, and unequal um, labor and all of those things. But I realized like that can't, this can't just be it. Like I do think there's something really valuable to just intellectual pursuit that has a place. And I think thinking is really important. Where would we be without CLR James? Or where would we be without Du Bois or all of these folks who, but who are also very involved in community. But there's also something about what, at least the University of California says that we are here to serve the public good. That's our, in the master plan. So make good on it, you know? I mean, I, I think for me, if, if I wanna write about communities, which I do, um, now I want to be in community with folks. I want to learn how, if I'm writing about getting free and I'm writing about mass incarceration, I should know how to do transformative and, uh, justice and rest restorative healing circles. So I want to learn and I want to learn from organizers. So I think part of it is just um, an ethical practice, um, but also arises out of a frustration with the institution as it is, which I think is going to change quite a bit and it should uh, now. The institution as you mean academia in particular in general yes mm -hmm. what about others what other questions do folks want to post in the q a i accidentally answered i just responded to a question and then it disappeared but there was a question from somebody in q a about how we handle the fact that in the universities are white supremacists by and large predominantly white institutions by and large um corporate neoliberal, you know, by and large, especially private schools. Uh, you've answered that to some extent, I realize, but it also sounds like you don't believe that the thing is so rotten to the core that it can't be used for, for the, your purposes, or do you, do you anticipate a transformation into something better? I'm always hopeful, um, but I'm also uh, very real about these things. I don't, I don't know, you know, the, the purpose of a lot of these academic institutions is profit. It's not actually education. So luckily there's some great folks inside who really believe in education and who are gonna keep doing it no matter what, who imagine themselves as insurgents inside of an institution. 
um, who, who have incredible students that keep them um, thinking really um, interesting and important things and keep us curious and, hu and human. Um, it's just like, you know, in your house. In your house, there's, I'm sure, all types of like ingrained patterns of like patriarchy and all kinds of things, right? But you don't move out of your house, you know, so, I mean, you can't really escape that. It is white supremacy and it should be named as such and it should be called in all, whatever, however you want to do it. Uh, but it's eventually you got to get back, you got to back away from the spin and the extraction that white supremacy also does, which is to constantly tire you out and to get you fundamentally distracted. And Toni Morrison talks about this. It's just the fundamental distraction of racism. And you gotta think about what makes you whole. So you notice the questions I'm asking you are, what makes you feel free, truly? And what makes you feel safe? And those things are so important because we wanna come from there. Cause I'm not saying anything that your question is bad. It's good, it's amazing, it's so important. And once we answer that question, once we recognize that, that that's where we're at, and, and also we recognize like, we'll never give up that fight. They, I mean, they get tired, we get tired, but we're not giving up. And we, and we, we have a whole lot of good things on our side and we have a legacy to uphold. What but, I loved about the answers to the questions you posed is that so many people about the freedom question answered um, in some form or other about being with other people. So many people wanted to cook for others. Um, and about safety, it was, it was freedom in, or safety in community. And I found myself thinking something like, could you imagine, you know, saying to people who answer, say it to myself, can you imagine that without other people, you know, whatever your answer was, could it exist without other people? And the answer, of course, is no, that those versions of safety and freedom could only exist with other people. Mm -hmm. And then the more difficult question is, can you imagine that on behalf of other people? You know, if that's good for you, cooking a good meal is good for you, isn't it good for somebody else? Well, what would it take to make that possible for somebody? else who might not have resources you have because of their economic situatedness, their racial situatedness. Such a great, thank you, such a great follow-up. And that's, that's, that's the thing is that when I'm asking those questions, your answers are where we begin. Mm -hmm. So if you, wanna, if you wanna cook for people, that means you need a place that, that uh, like a, a store that actually has fresh food. You need, you can't be living in a food desert and expect that you can constantly be cooking for people. You can't be living in a place where you don't feel safe sitting outside um, and have constant like outdoor picnics. You can hear my dog is like co-signing on that. Um, so, you know, these are, these are fundamental rights. I have the right to raise my child in a safe community or I have the right to not have kids, but I don't wanna have kids. And I have the right to, to feel embodied in a, in a safe way. So they all it all starts here you know like with with these feelings yes i think you're absolutely right Dean. there's a question in the chat from uh, ash about allies and accomplices the role of allies or accomplices on the path to freedom thank you what does solidarity we look like within the freedom making framework yes um this is a great question and i think one that's on everybody's minds because all of us have some privilege in one way or another and it's, it's not easy. And I do a lot of, of workshops for people, some really, really privileged people. And then some folks who are like, I don't feel like I got no privilege, never, ever, ever, ever. So what is the role then for people? So a lot of times what people think is, if, you're, if you wanna be an ally or an accomplice then you gotta really truly understand what these people are going through, you can't, you can't, and it's okay, it's all right. You gotta understand, yes, that like, means of production, the, the relationships of, 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 of the economy, the political economy of what's going on, understand as much as you want, you, sh you should as you can, you try as much as you can and get as close to, and people love that like spirit of, of accomplice and allyship, right? Um, so if you know that you, would, that I mean, just like I know I never walked in some other people's shoes, right? It's just as like a cis hetero person, like what it's like to be queer and really want to be out, what it's like to be trans and be in constant danger, like those things, I don't know. But I tell you, like, I will adopt a poise of curiosity and mm -hmm. I will ask when I don't know. And I'll always be in relationship to 
as much of choice that we can share as possible. So if I am, if if someone as uh, like I'm trying to be an accomplice or an ally to, says, hey, look, this thing you kind of came up short on. I don't. And in, in my curiosity, I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to learn more about it. It's not so much that having the right words or the, to taking the right professional development or checking the box, right? But it's a way of being. So it really requires a kind of turning into and deciding, this is who I want to be. I want to be an ally, accomplice on the path to freedom for historically marginalized and oppressed folks. Nobody should be able to throw you off that mark. That's you. And so this, what solidarity looks like is you never leaving that mark, no matter what happens, is you never leaving that role for yourself. And it's not easy. It is you constantly reasserting, I, mean, I messed that up. Can I, I say this all the time as a parent, I messed that up. Like, could I, um, can, can, I, can I try, have a do-over? Because I'm curious about what would happen if I had said something different. It's just about, and there's no amount, like you can't learn all the language, all the words. It's you, who you are. Keep coming back. Just keep beginning again. That's how you do it. I'm so delighted by that answer because I just heard Kianga Yamada Taylor give a very, very similar version of that same answer in an interview. And it was so shockingly clear and so generous, but also like handing responsibility back to you saying, you, you, you might've messed up, you might not, but, but you have to stay curious and stay in the game too. Uh, nobody should throw you out and, and don't step out of the circle just because you, you feel like you don't know. Mm. Um, so it's beautiful to hear this, this resonance of, between oh. your answer and hers. Well, we have time for a couple more questions. <laughs> uh, there's one or two, there's one more question here in the uh, Q&A about how do we as students resist practices of surveillance introduced into higher ed. You know, I know some people are celebrating how down at UC San Diego, they are able to monitor your sewage to see about the spread of COVID. And on the one hand, it's like amazing. And on the other hand, it's somewhat terrifying about you know, the implications for that kind of surveillance. So what do you have thoughts about this, about students in particular? Yeah, I, ooh, that's a really good question. And I will admit that it often stumps me. I try really hard not to be in a, spa a space of like despair or like giving up about my personal information because I know that everything is tracked. Everything, everything we do is tracked. Everything we do online, where we're going, there's always cameras everywhere, everything. So I'm not sure about how to not be surveilled. But when you say resist the new practices of surveillance introduced into higher ed, it makes me think, um, Davida de Rocher, is that right? I hope that. Uh, you're talking about organizing and you're talking about where the university invests its money. And that's an organizing question, I think. Um, and that is a question also of, of awareness all the time of what people are doing with your personal business. And people have a right to know that their, their information is being used. So people should always be what we call in restorative and transformative justice work at choice, like to, when I mean, we're not, right? We can't choose. It's just like I was telling you with the ring stuff, right? You get ring because you want to make sure your house is safe and the police, police can use it against your neighbor and arrest them over some BS, right? But you, you want to be able to, to constantly unveil. This is the beauty of Cedric Robinson's work is like, he always says that, you know, racial regimes are hostile to their own discovery. They, they hate being discovered peel back the curtain over and over again, if that's all you can do. However, the other thing you can do too is to create practices of community that are purposefully and intentionally outside of surveillance. So try, if you can, if you have spaces in nature where that's possible, um, but also practices that restore the wholeness of the human being. I think that's the only way that we're gonna like at least preserve our integrity as human beings. So it's a, that's a little bit of a different tack and a whole other conversation probably, but important nonetheless. In fact, it's the last question and I, this will probably be a good one to end on because you really did speak meaningfully about the, the cycle of activism and the necessity of restoration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so the final question I see in the Q and A's is, is if asking you to elaborate mm -hmm. on um, what that looks like, you know, what kinds of practices of, of rest and restoration uh, are you are you talking about? 
Oh, I love, I'd love to add to that question. It's actually the first time that anybody's asked me that in, in a very long time. I think maybe once somebody asked me that, but um, what am I doing right now is that, uh, so I had, I had started to write this book that Dean mentioned and I'm, re I'm really, you know, I'm spending time in the fields, farm workers, and then spending time with um, cultural conveners, people who, who, do, who, who are musicians, who practice like fandango, who are in Son Jarocho, who do like community convening, um, artists who are muralists, people like that, right? And who are just like doing that work, the goddesses work to bring us together. And I thought, well, I just don't know how I feel about this relationship ethically if I'm not involved somehow. And I don't, I don't imagine myself as like inserting myself there, but instead learn to practice. So yeah. learn an instrument or learn how to facilitate um, a circle uh, for, for victims and offenders. And so I've been learning with people. And when you learn with people how to do circles like that, and those, there are a lot of folks, you know, and this is really instructive for us because as much as everybody likes to talk about, oh, you know, the whole world is going to shit and it's awful and it's terrible. Yes, but all of this time in our communities, we have people, you, you know, the grandmas, right? Who are making the, who are making the the um the dinner after church, or we have the people who are um, making murals in places they're not supposed to be making murals. Um, I want to be in that. That's where I'm trying to be, and I'm I'm trying to also um, learn how to create peace and justice in places where they say it's impossible. Prisons, among foster kids in schools that are so elite that they can barely see what community they're in. I would love, I'd love to, to figure like how do, it's not so much me trying to figure out how do they solve that, but more how do the people who are completely outside of those experiences come in, learn and facilitate healing. And what are those organizers doing? That's what I wanna know. How are they keeping themselves whole and waiting in that rest place? What's the art that's being created? What are the conversations? What are ways that people are, are um, engaging with each other without um, re reinventing those same old ghosts that haunt us around judging each other, blaming each other, fighting amongst one, one, one another. Instead, what would happen if we all tried to like accept each other, learn how to give a real apology, learn that we don't just throw a community member away because they did something that wasn't cool. We don't just cancel them. We don't send them to foster care. We don't send them to jail. We try to practice, like try not to get caught up in that little call the police on that guy. No, let's talk. Developing those skills, right? Sometimes it doesn't work. And you, at one, the most important thing I learned in Transformative Restorative Justice is that you could say you're a victim and you decide, I don't want to participate in a victim offender circle. I don't want to talk to the person who killed my sister. I don't want to talk to that person. The amazing thing about this work is that that offender can apologize. They can learn the skills, right? To, to truly apologize through self-reflection and accountability. And you don't have to accept that apology, but that doesn't mean they can't still do the work. So there's places where people can always learn. So we learn in all times with all beings. And you don't have to be part of the conversations you don't want to be part of, but you can still do the work towards justice and healing and transformation. And that's how I stay in that. I have to tell you that after many scholarly talks, I find myself with a whole list of books I need to go read that have been referred to. And that happened, but I've also been making lists of emails I have to go send to my administrative colleagues and faculty colleagues. The subject line is, we have to do this thing. Um, I've got a long list of things. You more than incited me. Uh, I'm inspired, of course, but also I'm seeing things that I could only vaguely and, and inchoately perceive for uh, possibilities and pathways for new projects uh, for pedagogy and engagement. And I'm just so grateful to you. I'm very confident that uh, other folks who are on this 
um, uh, webinar felt to the fact that there's still 28 people <laughs> who have attended all the way at 620 tells me that I'm right. People are really into this. So mm -hmm. I thank you truly for this uh, extraordinary talk and conversation with us all. It was just really wonderful. Thank you so much, Gay. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate all of you who are here today that I can't see. Um, thank you for staying here in community with us. And I appreciate, I wish that I could be there in person, maybe next year. There was that time I was going to remind you, Dean, where I was, we were talking about, well, maybe we'll, we'll reschedule for April. And now here yeah. we are. <laughs> someday, someday. Thank someday. you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for attending. Bye, goodbye, goodbye. Thank you. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting now. Great, Just wanted to say you. thank you so much. Sorry for the hiccups there in oh, some of the, the tech, but that was, that was really wonderful. It all worked out. Thank all you right. so much. Take Have care. a good evening. Bye. Bye.